first of all, I'd like to both uh, thank both Mike and Davil for the opportunity to present to the Society. I think this is a great platform that they've come up with, and I'm glad to see that it's um, proving as, as successful as it is. Um, I, for one, would very much like to see this continue beyond the current uh, lockdown um, period, because I think it's a, it's a great resource for sharing information um, and possibly kicking off new ideas for collaboration, which is one of my motivations for uh, speaking to you today, because I think some of the tools that we're developing have great potential utility, both clinically and as experimental tools. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about some of the stuff that we, we're doing now, which we think has potential prognostic utility clinically, um, and then finish up with some thoughts on the future of PET imaging itself, because there are some very exciting developments coming down the tracks, which I think you'll find interesting. So just a, a little overview of uh, where we are. So the, I haven't actually traveled that far, ultimately. I've come back like a bad penny to St. Thomas's Hospital, where I started my PhD with Mike quite some time ago. Uh, so we're based on the uh, south bank of the Thames, directly opposite the Houses of Parliament. I just realized I should point my, turn my pointer on. Uh, so, so we're on the south bank of the Thames, uh, directly opposite the Houses of Parliament. Uh, we're a very large uh, school, uh, growing very rapidly. Um, and we're currently up to about 600 members of, 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 of staff uh, covering uh, the entire gamut of medical imaging uh, and biomedical engineering. Uh, we're very well resourced um, and it's very convenient um, and uh, very uh, useful that we're also co-located with one portion of uh, the School of Cardiovascular Medicine and Cardiovascular Research um, and we share the floor with many of the past and present leading lights of the OSHR and Mike Shattuck as well. Um, so I thought I would just start off bearing in mind the uh, interdisciplinary nature of the audience describing to you what PET is for those of you that aren't familiar with it. The idea is that basically we can we can radio label uh, small bio, biological molecules of interest um, to target biochemical processes, inject them into a patient and then use the scanner to follow where they go over time. So once we inject our radio traces they will travel through the bloodstream, hit their intracellular or cellular cell surface target and start to accumulate. Um, these are positron emitters, so they're firing off positrons which travel a short distance before they collide with an electron and they annihilate, um, giving rise to two gamma rays which fire off at 180 degrees to each other. This 180 degree line of interest is detected as two coincidence uh, events on the scanner, which is turned into a line of interest on the scanner. And because these, uh, these uh, disintegrations are happening at many hundreds, if not thousands of times a second, we can reconstruct these individual lines into a heat map uh, in two dimensions in the first instance of the distribution of the original uh, radionuclides. But because the scanner is a series, series of these crystals, we can stack these images and then pass the patient through the scanner so we can go from a two dimensional image to a three dimensional um, image of the distribution of our tracer. So this is a classic scan of the PET glucose tracer uh, FDG, fluorodeoxyglucose, showing its accumulation in the brain, the heart, and it's slowly clearing to the bladder. And if you look closely, you can see uh, hot spots in this patient's uh, armpits, and those are metastases in the lymph nodes in this particular patient. As the technology has improved over the years, uh, it's, been, it's, it's been possible to miniaturize it. So we now have small animal equivalents of these clinical scanners, which we can use for developing, validating new radio traces. And this is one of the scanners that we have in our department, which can accommodate either a mouse or a rat. And we can get images like this. So this is FSPG, um, which is a substrate for the XCT transporter. And we can use it um, to get an image effectively of uh, or a readout of glutathione synthesis as a biomicro oxidative stress in this mouse, which has got a xenografted tumor on its back. Um, the beauty of molecular imaging um, really is that it's not all about FDG, um, which is perhaps different sometimes from what you hear from cardiologists. It's an incredibly versatile technique, which is explo exploited for pretty much all medical disciplines. We can inject um, just naked metals, um, a field which um, is gaining ground as PET metalomics. Um, 
The stuff that you're more familiar with is uh, radio labeling of small molecules and peptides. Uh, this, for example, um, is a small peptide targeted against the prostate uh, specific uh, membrane antigen. And we can, we can use this molecule to deliver either an imaging or a therapeutic radionuclide. Uh, in this instance, this is gallium 68. And each one of these individual dots is a metastasis from a, from, uh, a, a patient with uh, prostate cancer. And we can then use this same molecule, switch out the imaging radionuclide for a therapeutic radionuclide and target to those cancers and then follow up afterwards with an imaging radionuclide again, the same one, and see how effective we've been at clearing those metastases. It's a really nice demonstration of the versatility of the approach. We can go larger, we can radio label uh, antibodies using bifunctional chelators of a variety of different radio metals. We can go larger still and radio label uh, drugs or therapeutic nanoparticles, or we can go larger still and radio label either uh, inflammatory cells or therapeutic cells, either by directly radio labeling them or genetically engineering them to express a unique or a, a not well expressed transporter and then follow their, their, their journey through the body and see how long they live over time by following up with an imaging agent with, which is a substrate for that transporter. So it's incre incredibly versatile. Despite that, there is still some rivalry, I guess, between the nuclear imaging guys and the uh, that I guess we call it the structural or functional imaging guys, uh, even in our department, and they wonder sometimes why we're mucking around with these fuzzy images um, when you can create these beautiful structural and functional images of the myocardium. Um, and they are indeed very useful, um, but there are, they, are, they do have some limitations. And I think PET and nuclear imaging in general can contribute to um, what is already uh, possible with, with these amazing techniques. And I think one, one area where these imaging techniques fall short is that the majority of them rely on imaging of structural or functional injury, which quite often is at the late stage in the pathology of the disease. Um, and the disease will have, will have been continuing for quite some time before the heart is no longer able to accommodate that change and you lose cardiac function. So what we're proposing, or, or I guess the, the, M, the, the MO of molecular imaging, um, is that we could potentially use these imaging uh, approaches that we're talking about to visualize the biochemical changes before they manifest as functional change, which is detected by these existing techniques. The other possibility for these imaging techniques is even in patients which have already been identified as being sick, is that by visualizing the biochemistry, we can better understand what's going on in these patients which have been identified as sick and use biochemical information to substratify them or to better understand the disease so we can improve or personalize their treatment. So with that in mind, the advantages that we have for PET and, and indeed SPECT in cardiology and cardiac research is that we can use these techniques to visualize intracellular mechanisms and characterize and quantify intracellular biomarkers in real time, in vivo, non-invasively. We've got unrivaled sensitivity. We can detect these radio traces down at the femtomolar range, which is more than a million fold more sensitive than MR, MRI or, even, or MR spectroscopy. And because of that, it means that the imaging agents that we use at the subpharmacological level, which means that we're imaging the biological system without perturbing it, which is also uh, quite an attractive prospect. So we, we think that these imaging agents or these imaging approaches would allow us to diagnose cardiovascular disease earlier, to potentially provide new mechanistic insight into the disease processes, to diagnose or stratify disease beyond the limits of structural functional imaging like MRI or echocardiography or CT as, as is currently done. And crucially, and again, this is something that we're not really exploiting yet, but we, we really should, is to use these techniques to, to provide non-invasive biomarkers um, of, the, of the early effectiveness of candidate drugs, or indeed to look at cardiotoxicity, where you don't have to wait for the effect of your drug to manifest in terms of changes in, uh, in terms of the long-term response in terms of cardiac uh, recovery or patient mortality or morbidity, because we can actually directly visualize the downstream biochemical changes caused by the drug as it happens or immediately thereafter. So we're just, we're just scratching the surface in terms of what's possible with these imaging agents because we're only limited largely by our, our imagination and then secondary, secondarily the chemistry. Um, 
So we have a number of different projects going on. And one of my motivations for talking to, to you was to see whether or not you had any ideas for anything else that we could potentially be looking at. But we were just one small group. And the things that we're looking at at the moment are uh, hypoxia, mitochondrial dysfunction and cardiotoxicity, oxidative stress, metabolic remodeling and ionic homeostasis. In the time that I've got available, I'm only going to focus on the first two of these, but they're quite good exemplars of the approach that we take generally. So when we're uh, developing radio traces, we take a fairly simple approach of testing for um, avidity, uh, specificity, um, selectivity in cells and culture, where we have absolute control over the environment in terms of studying the uptake of these traces, but it's in a situation where we have relatively little clinical relevance. It's hard to know how these traces would behave in the body. If we go the other way and we can inject these radio traces directly into humans or into animals as a first, as a first guess, uh, effectively. Um, the problem is under those circumstances, we get full clinical relevance, but it's very hard to validate or understand what those imaging images mean because we can't really have those kind of extra, the interventions that we need to be able to validate the biochemistry of the traces under those circumstances. So we have this translational gap, which bearing in mind my background, um, we've exploited the isolated perfused heart as an intermediate step where we can use the isolated heart to screen and characterize these radio traces to validate their mechanism and to get some idea of the biological context in which they accumulate in the heart so that when we then do inject them into animals or into patients, we know what's going on in the heart. So we've built this rather Heath Robinson contraption around our isolated perfused heart apparatus, which is effectively a stripped down PET scanner. Um, so we can inject our radio tracer into our buffer stream, um, upstream of our isolated perfused heart, and we can inject our radio tracer here as either a uh, bolus injection or as an infusion, and then we can trace the fate of our radio tracer through our perfusion apparatus via a series of sodium iodide gamma detectors. So we have one over the arterial input line, one interrogating the heart itself, and the third one measuring radio tracer as it washes out of the heart uh, in the venous effluent. Here's the setup from the other side. Here's our isolated perfused heart. Here's a lead collimator opened up onto the heart so that this, heart, this detector can detect radio tracer washout and accumulation. And obviously we can do all the things that we would normally do in, term, in, in an isolated heart in terms of measure, measuring ventricular uh, perfusion, uh, sorry, ventricular contractile function with an intraventricular balloon or uh, perfusion pressure via a sidearm, et cetera, et cetera. So the first example of a radio tracer that we've been developing uh, is copper uh, ATSM. This is a bis-thiosemicarbazone. It's a small lipophilic molecule, which is effectively a cage, which allows us to deliver uh, radio copper to the cell and to deposit that copper into the cell when it's hypoxic. This is how we think that these traces work. We inject them into the bloodstream. Um, they're small, they're lipophilic, they diffuse into the cell very easily whereupon they're potentially reduced from this uh, stable copper two complex to a relatively unstable copper one species, um, which in a normoxic cell isn't too problematic because there's plenty of oxygen around which allows it to become reoxidized back to the stable complex um, and then uh, leave the cell. However, if this complex enters a hypoxic cell, the first thing is that that's usually more uh, reductive environment in the first place, so it increases the propensity for it to become reduced, um, but crucially, there's less oxygen around, so it's less likely to become reoxidized. It hangs around as this unstable species for longer, and it's more likely to fall apart and deposit its copper into a hypoxic cell where it wouldn't do in a normoxic cell, and that's how we get our PET contrast. The beauty of this approach is that these compounds are eminently tweakable. We can make them more lipophilic or um, by modifying the side chains on the molecule to change their pharmacokinetics or we can change their redox potential so that they can become, um, so that they will um, potentially deposit their radio copper in the cell at different oxygen tensions. So we've, we've developed a library of these compounds with a variety of different pharmacokinetic properties and hypoxia selectivities. And the next phase of our work is to screen these to identify one which is most useful for applications in cardiology. So this is a, a series of readouts from, this, from the middle detector of our triple gamma detection apparatus looking at 
uh, the retention and washout of several of these candidate radio traces in an isolated diffused heart. So we inject our radio tracer and it washes into and out of the heart relatively quickly in normoxia. This is down, this is washing out within 10 minutes and there's relatively little of the tracer retained. However, if we switch our heart over to a hypoxic buffer perfusion, you can see that under those conditions it washes in and a significant amount of it is trapped. The more the trait, the more hypoxic the heart is, the more of it, the more of it is trapped. We compare copper ATSM, which is one of our original lead compounds, with copper PTSM, which has got a, a higher redox, sorry, a lower redox potential. Um, it's effectively more unstable and it deposits its radio copper in cells even if they're normoxic. And this has got potential utility as a perfusion imaging agent. Oh, sorry. Um, the other thing that we can do, as I said, is we can, we can have compounds which have got similar redox potentials but are, are more lipophilic. And this compound has a similar hypoxia selectivity to copper ATSM, but its kinetics are slower. And just to demonstrate that this, these properties are down to the, the complex as opposed to just naked copper, if we inject ionic copper, you can see that that rattles through the heart without touching the sides, irrespective of whether the heart is normoxic or hypoxic. So potential applications for these imaging agents, we're not looking at something to compete with um, perfusion imaging per se, uh, as is currently uh, done uh, by MRI, but there are certain conditions where MRI um, isn't able to identify poor perfusion, and that's down at the cellular level. Uh, under conditions like coronary microvascular disease, for example, where the, where the perfusion is down at the microvascular level and it's patchy and it's diffuse and it's global. Um, and that is very hard to quantify and to normalize perfusion like that via MR. And at the moment, um, coronary microvascular disease is largely identified clinically by the exclusion of all other uh, possibilities. With these traces, because we're identifying hypoxia um, at the cellular level as a positive uptake of the tracer, we think that we could possibly use these traces for identifying microvascular disease. In the same line, um, microvascular disease um, is also uh, a characteristic of off-target uh, cancer therapies, both in terms of uh, re uh, radiotherapy and the treatment of mediastinal lung or breast cancer, quite often the heart is inadvertently clipped by the radiotherapeutic beam, causing uh, microvascular injury and, and cardiac injury. Um, and also with some of the anti-angiogenic cancer therapies, they're also known to be cardiotoxic and we wonder whether or not we could use these imaging agents to detect that. Um, a slightly more speculative application that, we're, inter that we're, we're interested in pursuing is whether or not we can detect cardiac hypertrophy or in specifically the, the progression of cardiac hypertrophy to failure as the heart hypertrophies, vascular density decreases, the myocytes get larger, and they also detubulate. And we wonder whether or not this increased diffusion distance between the vasculature and the mitochondria may make those cells essentially hypoxia, hypoxic, even though their perfusion, as determined by MRI, um, may actually not be markably or, or uh, might, might not be markably uh, changed or measurably changed. So. We performed a thought experiment, I guess, in terms of trying to work out what we wanted to hit in terms of our hypoxia imaging agents and what we wanted them to correlate with so that we could use that as a basis for screening the traces that we have. So if we think about the progression of ischemia in terms of increasing ischemic duration or severity from the relatively benign to the irreversible where we have myocardial infarction, scar tissue formation, we rationalized that our imaging agents would probably be most useful at this point where we've got the onset of loss of capacity to maintain our, uh, energy uh, or uh, uh, cardiac energy um, in terms of phosphor creatine levels and, and ATP. Because once you start losing ATP, ionic homeostasis goes south and everything goes bad pretty quickly. So we performed a series of titrations in our isolated perfused heart in the bore of our 9.4 uh, Tesla NMR magnet to identify the threshold at which the buffer oxygen saturation at which uh, phosphor creatine levels critically start to fall. Um, and we performed a series of titrations, um, looking, uh, starting off with buffer oxygen saturation at about 95% O2, winding down to complete anoxia, and then tracking the functional and biochemical changes as we did this. Um, so if we look at cardiac uh, left ventricular development pressure, that starts to fall critically when buffer oxygen saturation hits about 
by phosphorus NMR spectroscopy, we can see that phosphocreatine starts to fall critically at this 30% threshold. Um, HIF stabilization starts to uh, become significantly uh, elevated at 30%. You can detect the story here. Um, and lactate washout from the heart also starts to increase at that point. And this is quite a, an interesting uh, position because what we're seeing here is elevated lactate washout, but it's not maximal, which suggests that the myocardium is compromised it's glycolytic, but there is still some residual mitochondrial function. So we, we rationalize that together, we're at a threshold which would be very interesting for our hypoxia imaging agents to be able to hit. So we performed the reciprocal experiments on our triple detector system and looked at some of our candidate traces. And lo and behold, one of our candidate traces, copper CTS, has an inflection point where it seems to accumulate very, very well at this key 30% threshold. This is what we're thinking of taking forward to the next phase of our valuation, which is in vivo. Does it work in vivo? Unfortunately, I can't give you the answer. This is work in, pro work in progress. Um, I can tell you that in terms of the trace of pharmacokinetics, it doesn't these traces don't accumulate in healthy myocardium, which is a good place to start. And we've been developing some um, models of cardiac hypertrophy by, by aortic banding, which is going well. And we've got some tantalizing data um, demonstrating that in some of these hearts, they are indeed essentially hypoxic as, as given by pyomonidas or staining, but we've not yet managed to marry these two work streams together to image hypoxia in these, in these animals, but that's very much where we'd like to go next. So very quickly, a second application that we're, that we're, we're, we're very interested in is anthracycline cardiotoxicity. And this is something which is gaining a lot of ground in the literature as being a very significant and increasing problem. Uh, the anthracyclines have been around since the 1960s and in recent years with cancer detection rates accelerating as they are, patients are being treated with them much earlier, which means that we're getting to a situation now where patients are living much longer with the off-target uh, cardiotoxics effects of these anthracyclines so that increasingly patients aren't dying of the cancer, they're dying of the cardiotoxicity as a result of their treatment. The problem is that um, and again, with our, with our existing paradigm, the majority, of, the majority of diagnosis of this cardiotoxicity um, is done many years after the chemotherapy is concluded, and it's largely done by looking at functional, functional changes, which is quite often too late to do anything about because the injury has already happened. And at the moment, there are very few, if any, treatments for this cardiotoxicity beyond managing the heart failure itself. So this is, we think, an ideal opportunity for molecular imaging because not only can we do we know when the anthracyclines have been treated, we can actually use the patients themselves as a control for our imaging experiments because we know what they looked like beforehand. So there are a variety of different targets that we're interested in um, as molecular imaging uh, targets. Um, and yeah, we've got a, we've, we're making some progress in the majority of these, but one central nexus for a majority of the uh, mediators of anthracycline cardiotoxicity are the mitochondria. And as luck would have it, we've already got a mitochondrial imaging agent, which has been used in the clinic um, for 20 years, but for a different purpose. And that's uh, technetium sestamibi, which has uh, classically been used as a perfusion imaging agent, but in fact, it's a lipophilic cation and it's retained within the myocardium by virtue of the fact that it traps in patent mitochondria. So we wondered whether or not if we could use a second imaging agent, which is a true perfusion imaging agent, and in this case, we're, we're proposing using uh, technetium moet, we can compare and contrast the uptake of one imaging agent, which is perfusion dependent um, with a mitochondrial component, with an imaging agent which is perfusion dependent and doesn't have a mitochondrial component, and subtract one from the other to get a real measurement of mitochondrial membrane potential non-invasively, as a readout of early cardiotoxicity. Now, this approach is something that I'm sure many of you are familiar with because this is, a fluid, this is an exact equivalent of the fluorometric approaches that are currently used with um, JC1 or TMR, uh, TMRE or rhodamine 1, 2, 3, but this is a non-invasive approach where we can, use the same, we can use the same approach. So this is the cardiac retention of sestamibi in an isolated perfused heart, very reproducible. Every time we inject it, it traps in pretty much the same profile. Where we make the heart hypoxic, we depolarize the mitochondria and it washes out. Compare that with uh, technetium know it. Retention profile is largely the same. 
but is completely independent of hypoxia. So we've got proof of concept that this would work. We zeroed in and did the same experiments, but we actually selectively depolarized the mitochondria with the ionophore CCCP. And you can see there's a dose dependent washout of the tracer. Um, and again, no, it is completely untouched by mitochondrial depolarization. Does it work in vivo? Happily, it seems to. We've done some pilot experiments um, looking at washout of cestamibi in rats which have been treated two weeks previously with the anthracycline doxorubicin. And we do see this dose dependent washout, which isn't um, reciprocated with technetium noet. Now, this is SPECT. The advantage of SPECT is, as I said, that these traces are already clinically available. We could go with this tomorrow, um, but the images are quite fuzzy. Um, so we're looking to refine it um, by translating it to PET, and uh, we're developing some PET equivalents of SESTA. Maybe this is an F18 uh, labeled molecule, which performs in largely the same way. So the message I'm trying to get across here is that imaging isn't, uh, while imaging is, um, or imaging technology development is quite heavily gained uh, or focused on the gains in terms of spatial and temporal resolution. It's not all about that. And these imaging approaches for global myocardial injury are much more about sensitivity and mechanism than they are about resolution. So in terms of technology development, um, PET is being married up with um, the other imaging modalities to try and mitigate the poor resolution that you have. So we get these very nice compound images where you have the anatomical inf information overlaid over the biochemical information. You can't now buy a PET scanner which doesn't have CT attached to it. The next generation of these is PET MRI scanners, and we're lucky enough to have one of these at St. Thomas's. Um, but the next generation of these scanners, which we're very uh, interested in, has been only recently published this year, and this is work by Simon Cherry and Ramsey Badawi at UCSF, which is whole body PET. And the approach that they've taken is that the existing PET scanners are a relatively narrow ring. And if you think about how these trace, these scanners work, the majority of the radio, the gamma rays which our tracers are emitting are outside of the field of view. So we're actually only detecting a very small proportion of the radio tracer that we've injected. So they rationalized if you could build a bigger scanner, you would get, um, you would get more sensitivity. And I think they were quite pleasantly surprised, although they, they had um, simulated it, how good these scanners were. So they've, they've built one of these things and they've, they've uh, reached a six-fold gain in signal to noise with it, where you, which you can then exploit to either image faster, image longer or later, uh, image with a lower dose, or get total body coverage, which is really useful in terms of tracking the pharmacokinetics of the tracer um, from the point of injection and seeing exactly where it goes all at the same time across the entire body. This is the scanner with its, um, with its clothes off, as it were. It's effectively eight scanners strapped together. But the image quality that you get is quite phenomenal. So this patient has been injected with a 20th of the standard dose of FDG. Um, this has one very uh, useful advantage, and it means that you have the capacity to potentially co-inject or serially inject multiple radio traces detecting multiple things. So you could have parameter maps of different biochemical processes which you could overlay and interleave. And this is something which we're calling multiplexed, or as we call uh, multiplex imaging. And we think that the prospects for this are very exciting because you could compare, for example, perfusion, metabolism, mitochondrial function all in one patient and see how that tracks during disease process, or indeed perfusion, mitochondrial function and ROS generation. The, again, the, the, the potential for this is phenomenal. And finally, this is a very nice video that they released again this year showing, again, the gains in terms of temporal resolution. We can now get one second time bins um, of the distribution of a tracer from its injection. You can see it going to the heart, back to the lungs, back to the heart again. And now we're going out to, uh, so these are still one second bins. And you can see it distributing throughout the patient, starting to clear to the liver, going out to the brain. And then it gradually turns into a PET scanner that you're more used to seeing. So those are, those are one second bins. They can even go down to uh, 100 milliseconds. Um, and so this is effectively real time PET imaging. So this is different from what you would see with MRI where you have uh, time averaged uh, cardiac gated images. This is actually in real time. Um, so it's very impressive. And I think they're still trying to work out exactly what they can do with this technology, but um, hopefully you're gonna have some ideas too.
So just to summarize, nuclear, me nuclear molecular imaging is low resolution compared to the other techniques, but it's infinitely versatile, it's exquisitely sensitive, it's tissue depth independent compared to fluorescence techni techniques, for example, it's prognostic, it's mechanistic, and it's potentially multi-parametric, and it's evolving, and it's still underexploited in cardiology compared to some of the other disciplines, which is something that I'd very much like to remedy. So it just leaves me to thank um, our funders, the BHF have been great in terms of supporting me for many years, and the Engineering and Physical Research uh, Council, um, and then finally to thank uh, the uh, very talented people that's been my great pleasure to work with over the years, um, who without them, none of this work would be possible. So uh, thank you very much for your attention and I'll be happy to take questions. Brilliant. Uh, Davo, that was, uh, if you could just, yeah, stop sharing your screen. Richard, uh, fantastic presentation. Uh, could I just appeal to, uh, the participants out there, if you've got any questions, please post them via the Q&A panel uh, in your uh, Zoom window. Uh, post any questions. We've got some questions already. Uh, you can see from Richard's presentation why I feel at liberty to uh, take the mickey about his haircut because I can't take the mickey about his science because that was phenomenal, Richard. I think very exciting. Uh, techniques, very exciting data, uh, really, really impressive. And, and as you say, you know, the appeal to everybody out there is look, you know, uh, what can be done with these fantastic techniques. I mean, it really is uh, the future as is uh, hinted at in the title. So Richard, a really lovely presentation. Let's have a look at uh, the q and I, I don't know, Richard, if you can call up the Q&A panel and have a look. Yeah, I've got it. If you could, uh, why don't we just uh, leave it to you, start at the top and um, say who the question's from, read the question if it's uh, not impolite, and uh, <laughs> see if work our way through the questions. Sure. Um, okay, so the first question is from uh, Giulio Agnetti. Uh, he says, very interesting topic. Will you be talking about recent developments in optical imaging, as hopefully at some point they will be applicable to humans? Thanks. Um, this is somewhat out of my field, I'm afraid. Um, what I would suggest is that I, I think um, one, of, one of the advantages that we have in the very large division that we have is that we do have a very large breadth of expertise across all of the imaging modalities. Um, and I think well, the cop-out question that I would, I would the cop-out answer that I would have would be that you, are, that you invite some of my colleagues in to do a follow-up question in terms of what's possible with fluorescence imaging. Um, I think it would be, I think there's, there's possibilities for, again, multimodal um, fluorescence and nuclear imaging. And I think it'd be very nice to sort of go backwards and forwards between the scales, um, both um, in vivo and ex vivo, sort of in terms of uh, parallel biomarkers. Um, but it's not really something that I'm that much of an expert in, so I wouldn't really like to, to comment. So, so may I just interject and say, if anybody in the audience has an opinion as well as, you know, rather than a question, they can also uh, post in the Q&A. Okay, next question, Richard. Yeah, sure. So the, the next question is about uh, NIR, and I guess I, I, would, I, would, I, would go in the, I would go in the same, I would go in the same way, I would respond in the same way. Um, so an anonymous attendee asks, how will, be the, how will the trade radio traces be removed from the system? Does it have any side effects? So the majority of these radio traces, um, are, or pretty much all of these radio traces, are cleared by either the, the liver or, uh, or, or the bladder, or sorry, by the kidneys. Um, the advantage of a lot of these traces is that they've actually got very short half-lives. Um, so a lot of them will just decay in the patient anyway. I mean... Um, F18, for example, has got a half-life of about 110 minutes. So you're, you're radioactive for a day um, and you're safe to go home. Many of the, many of, many of the uh, radionuclides that we're also interested in uh, have half-lives very much shorter than that. Um, and, and in fact, that's one significant advantage. I'm, I've, I was talking about copper-64 um, for our hypoxia imaging agents. Uh, and that's got a half-life of 12 hours, which isn't ideal, 
Um, but we're using it because it's generated in a cyclotron in the basement of our hospital. And it means that we can have a radio tracer that we can play around with for a few days, um, just from one batch. So it's good for us to do our, our tracer development with, but if we were to translate it clinically, we can, we can switch out copper 64 for copper 62, which has got a half-life of 20 minutes. Um, so that means that we can exploit exactly the same radiochemistry, but have a radio tracer which is effectively safer for the patient. The other advantages of copper 62 is that it doesn't require a cyclotron. Uh, it can be made in a generator. Um, and with the rapid pharmacokinetics of these tracers, as we've shown that they clear, they clear from they clear from non-hypoxic tissues within minutes, we can get away with having a very short half-life radio tracer. So quite often what we'll try and do is match the biological half-life of our tracer to the radioactive half-life of the radionuclide that we use. So we always try and minimize the exposure to the patient by having a radio tracer which does what it does in terms of hitting its target so that we can image it, but it doesn't hang around in the patient for a long time thereafter. But Richard, realistically, uh, what, what would be the effect of an exposure of, um, you know, 12 hours to a radioactivity of that level once or twice in your life? Um, it's, again, it's, it's difficult. It, it depends on the radio tracer. And, you know, there are, uh, my, my, my boss, Phil, has this slightly hokey slide, which I was going to use, called the nuclear chocolate box, where he's, he's basically got the periodic table and he uses... He uses that as a demonstration of all the different potential radionuclides that you can use. And it's not just about how much, how much of the radio tracer that you use, but the, but the mode by which it decays. In the, is, it an, is it an alpha emitter, a beta emitter, um, or a pure gamma emitter, for example? So it depends on which radio tracer that you use. Some of them are therapeutic, some of them are pure imaging, some of them can be both. Um, for a standard FDG PET scan, um, so FAT, um, you're typically injecting a patient with about 400 megabecarars of activity, um, which would give you an effective dose of about six millisieverts. And that's about the equivalent of living in the southwest of England for a year. I say the southwest of England because <laughs> Cornwall has a lot of granite. Um, and that's, what, that's, that's, the, that's your annual dose for just living there. In London, we're safer. It's only about a third of that. Um, so that's one, one of the benefits of living in London is that you have lower exposure to radiation. Um, but in terms of imaging, it's perfectly tolerable. And in fact, the CT component of your imaging is quite often potentially more dangerous, if you want to use that word, um, than the radionuclides. But the other considerations are about where your radionuclide targets to, because some organs are more sensitive to radiation than others are. So you have to think about where it, where it accumulates, where it clears via. Um, and then you have to think about the mode of decay, um, because obviously if, you're, if you've got something which has got a larger proportion of, of beta decays, then it's potentially more hazardous. So it's, it's, it's one of the, I'm not a nuclear, I'm not a medical physicist, so I can't answer this. Um, any more thoroughly than that, but that gives you a rough idea. So I, I did actually ask a medical physicist about this earlier, um, and I asked him whether or not you would ever preclude an imaging test because it was too dangerous for the patient. And he said that it never, it never happens that way around. If you, can, if you can justify the imaging test because it's clinically important for the decision-making, you will always get the test. So it's a consideration, and we always go out of our way to minimize the dose that we expose patients to, but it's not the primary consideration and the doses are very tolerable. Next question, Richard. Next question. Does the earlier detection, so this is from uh, Sina Hadapur, uh, does the earlier detection of myocardial dysfunction with molecular imaging lead to better patient outcomes, i.e. Are, in, are interventions useful in those earlier early stages which are not captured by functional imaging? The idea. Good question. <laughs> that is exactly the idea, um, and I, I guess the, I guess time will tell is the answer because this this isn't really being done at the problem, and this is at the moment, and this is this is the this is our motivation for the work, and I, I think we're very excited about the cardiotoxicity angle because I think it's almost the exact perfect exemplar of 
this paradigm because you know what your patient looks like before you've given them the amphocycline. So for example, you would expect their cardiac accumulation of maybe would be, would be high because they're, they're healthy, they've got cancer, but usually their myocardium would be fairly, fairly healthy. Um, and then you could potentially serially track after their chemotherapy when their mitochondria become depolarized. And so the question then is, when do you image? And again, this is gonna require a lot of serial imaging on our part experimentally because you need to, we want to capture this injury as soon as possible. But at the moment, because we don't have these diagnostic tools, we don't know when this pathology happens. At the moment, all we're doing is we're measuring the end event. And we don't know what the timelines of all of these biochemical sequelae are, which eventually leads to mitochondrial dysfunction. So until, until you have these biological readouts, non-invasively, that you can follow serially, we don't know when is the best time to use them. Uh, and that's, that's, the, that's the thing that we're looking forward to doing next. And that once we've validated our traces and we know that they detect what we think they detect, we can then use them serially to then see what happens in experimental animals over time to see if we can determine what the timeline for their use should be. And then we can then extrapolate back to when we should then use that as an imaging test clinically. So the answer, the, 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 long, the long story short is that we don't know because nobody does it, but that's the approach that we are proposing. Oh, very good. Sorry, can I ask? I mean, I, I know I'm not chairing, Mike, and I apologize, but I'm just really no, no, interested. Kevin. So, so then you'd have to re reinvent the, the, let's say, the clinical therapy, because how would you know that, you know, if you don't see a dysfunction and you detect a change, then how do you know that it's appropriate to, to treat clinically that patient with the same drugs? I guess it's going to have to be one of these things where you, you phase it in incrementally. I guess, I mean, the, the, the first question or the next question that you would ask is, yes, you can detect these biochemical changes, but are they predictive of eventual outcome? And so that would be the first clinical trial, I guess, is that, yes, and this, this is, I mean, there are, I, a nice exemplar of this would be um, cardiac troponin measurements, for example, in that you can measure troponin in blood immediately after chemotherapy. Um, which is indicat indicative of cardiac injury, but it's not actually then predictive of cardiac outcome. So what we're going to have to do in the first instance is to use these imaging tests, see what we see, and then see how that then compares with existing diagnostic techniques for then looking at the eventual outcome and then extrapolating backwards. <laughs> So we've got our work cut out for a few years, I think it's, I think it's fair to say. But I think the, the nice thing I think that we've got is that with Sestamibu, we've got something which is ready to go now. And then once we've got proof of concept that this approach works, we can then get more exotic with some of the other traces that we've got in our pipeline. So that's the approach that we're taking, which is a, a foot in the door with Sestamibu. And then we'll get more exotic once we know what we're doing. I guess, Richard, it's fair to say that um you know, there, there are some low hanging fruit and, you know, the cardiotoxicity of your cancer therapies, uh, I'm not saying this is easy, but I don't think there's many people out there who would argue that mitochondrial depolarization is a bad thing, is, is a good thing. You know, the mitochondrial depolarization is almost certainly a bad thing. So if you can measure that early uh, and your therapeutic intervention shows that you can treat that early, you know, I, I can see very little argument that says you wouldn't do that. Okay, that this is this yeah. is fairly obvious. The, the the cause and effect relationship. I think your example of cardiac troponins is is slightly uh, can come back and uh, bite you in the behind because you know you can imagine that if you came up with a therapy that all it did was chelate circulating troponin, this is not going to treat the problem of myocardial injury it's just treating the symptom um, so yes there's a good point that, it, that your biomarker has to be causally associated with the disease process itself Absolutely. but in the case of uh, yeah anthracycline toxicity I don't think anybody out there is going to say oh well maybe mitochondrial depolarization is a good thing it's not it, it, it must be I mean I don't think you'll find many dissenters to 
if we can do something and intervene that stops that happening, this is most likely to be a good thing. So, so I think it's very exciting, really, really exciting. It reminded me actually, one of the other applications that we're looking at is actually in just the general cardiotoxicity of all other drugs. Yes. In that a, very, a very large proportion of all drugs for all indications fail in clinical trial because of cardiotoxicity. Yes, um, so if you could, if so you could actually you, get your act together quickly here, Richard, COVID-19 is actually high on your list of things that cause unexplained cardiotoxicity. So uh, if you could go to the lab now, that would be very handy. <laughs> sure, okay, I'll get on my bike. <laughs> okay, next question. Uh, 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 right, so uh, Viva Rani asked, the major concern is soft tissue discrimination, sensitivity and toxicity. Could you please comment on this? What advancements have been done to overcome these limitations? Um, so that's largely, I mean, soft tissue discrimination, this is usually more of a concern with techniques like CT. Uh, these techniques are actually exclusively soft tissue. Well, not exclusively, because we can use um, bone targeting imaging agents, but for, example, uh, for example, but that's not really a concern for this. This is soft tissue imaging. Uh, Gary Lopeshuk. Uh, says, uh, how dependent is the copper, this thiosemic chromosome accumulation in hypoxic cells dependent on coronary flow? Great question. Uh, what impact does the presence of ischemia impact tissue accumulation of this tracer? Um, this is a key question. Um, this is something which has been confounding uh, the application of these tracers in oncology where the perfusion is that much lower. Uh, copper ATSM, the lead compound was designed um, for imaging cancer because it targets very extreme degrees of hypoxia. Um, and in the, the very first pass of its accumulation, its distribution is limited by perfusion, but it eventually gets there and washes out. Um, we think that for the applications that we're talking about, the perfusion isn't going to be critically limited enough to limit the delivery of these traces because they're very small and lipophilic. However, we don't know. And so one of the things that we would like to do is to use these multiplexing approaches that we're talking about because we could compare and contrast, for example, our hypoxia imaging agent delivery and distribution with that of either the other copper trace that I talked about, copper, uh, copper uh, PTSM or, or GTSM, which are not hypoxia selective, and we could compare and contrast the retention of those. Um, and we could do that by, by multiplexed imaging. Um, so that's kind of the, the, uh, the idea. The other, the other thing that we can do potentially is we can look at the regional, uh, the rate of flow of our traces on a voxel by voxel basis and actually get pharmacokinetic modeling of the rate of influx and the rate of efflux of these traces. And again, we wonder whether or not by doing that, we might actually be able to get a handle on perfusion from the rate at which the tracer moves into tissues. And we could possibly even use that to correct for perfusion in the image as it, as it happens. Uh, James uh, John uh, says, maybe I missed it, but is it possible to multiplex multiple dyes? Yes, indeed it is. Um, so I, I finished that with at the end. Um, and this is something which we're really looking forward to playing around with. Um, we, can, we can potentially separate out those radio traces um, by virtue of, um, they're going to have different individual pharmacokinetics in the first instance. Um, and so you could potentially inject, yeah, as you're working the methodology up, you can inject each radio tracer individually and see what its individual pharmacokinetics are so that you can then retrospectively tease them out. But you could also inject radio traces which have got different decay half-lives. And so then you could then uh, serially inject them and pull them apart by the rate at which each individual signal decays by deconvoluting the washout curves. Uh, this is something that our colleague Andrew Reader is going to be looking at um, and possibly exploiting machine learning and AI to see whether or not we can optimize that so that it can be done uh, rapidly and as effectively as possible. Uh, Kurt Zubier, my old friend, says beautiful presentation. Rick, thanks mate. Uh, uh, anonymous attendee, I've been working with Kurt for a long time. Um, is there any evidence of these traces uh, interacting with common cardiac disease drugs, statins, antihypertensins, etc.? No, uh, as I said at the front of this talk, we're down at the 
femtomolar concentrations or lower uh, with these traces. So there's very, they're very unlikely to do anything. Uh, Kurt's followed up with a question. So he's hit me with a, with a compliment first, and now he's going to come in for the kill. Uh, one question, do you know the cellular oxygen tension when your copper tracer goes up? Uh, thus, when the incoming oxygen tension goes down to 40% in the isolated heart. Great question, Kurt. This is something that Mike has asked me several times before. We've had a back on back and forth on it on, on numerous occasions. Um, and I have a standard cop-out question, a cop-out cop answer. And that is, we, we realise that we don't actually need to know what the intracellular oxygen saturation is, in that even if we could hang a number on it, what number are you interested in? Are you interested in the oxygen saturation at complex four, where the oxygen is being used? Are you interested in the intracellular oxygen saturation? Are you interested in the vascular uh, or the interstitial oxygen saturation? It's hard to work out which of those things we need to know in the first instance. And we kind of sidestep the issue by actually rationalizing that the cell doesn't care what the absolute number of oxygen molecules there are there. It only cares about how much oxygen it has to produce ATP. And so we turn the argument on its head and we just thought, we only really need to know when the cell is hypoxic enough that it can't maintain ATP levels, because that's the thing which is actually diagnostically or prognostically useful to us. So it's a sidestep, but we actually think that it's correlation of our traces with changes in cardiac energetics, which is most useful. And that's the rationale that we've taken. It's a good question though. And we do, it would be something that would be, be very nice to measure, um, but there is no technique as far as I'm aware that you can actually measure it with. So there are no comparisons. Uh, Laura Summerfield, thank you for sharing the images. Unfortunately, you did not get enough time to speak about all the applications. I think on one side, you've mentioned the tracing of ions uh, exporters in the heart, sodium I think it was. Could you maybe comment on what you have looked at or what possibilities there are? Um, sodium, not by, uh, not by PET, but we can do by MRI. And Mike is grinning because this is something that I started trying to do for him with NMR spectroscopy about 15 years ago, struggled for a very long time, gave up and handed it over to somebody more competent, who's my colleague, Tom Eakin who has been collaborating with Mike for a very long time, um, doing intracellular sodium measurements by MR spectroscopy. In terms of PET, the thing that we're interested in developing is uh, imaging with rubidium-82, which behaves like thallium, in fact, as a congener of potassium. Um, rubidium has also been used as a perfusion imaging agent in cardiology for donkey's years, as has thallium. Um, and we wonder whether or not, it's the same rationale as technetium sestimibium, in fact, in that it's a perfusion imaging agent, but it, it accumulates in the heart by virtue of act activity of the sodium potassium pump. So if we can correct uh, rubidium images for perfusion, then we could potentially also tease out um, sodium potassium pump function. And this is something I don't want to speak too much about it because I would like Tom Eakin to speak on this forum at some point, and at some point, and I don't want to—I don't want to steal his thunder. But it'd be very interesting to look at the interrelationship between rubidium and sodium by combined PET and, and NMR. But Rick, would you able? Would you ever be able to dissociate intracellular text from extracellular? Uh, with rubidium, um, I don't know i think i i to be honest i don't know um i think you maybe if you're playing around with the pharmacokinetics of it you might be able to tease out the two but i i don't know to be honest um yes, we've not actually used we, 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 detecting yeah, extra yeah, right so yeah yeah i mean we, we've spoken we've spoken about it but we've not yet done anything with it. uh heinrich take my hi heinrich uh he says why has the viability concept of PET perfusion mismatch never taken off? Will it take off now? I don't know. Um, this is something I, 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 I dabbled with this many years ago, and I know that you, know, you, you, you did a huge amount of work on this in the past. Um, and it makes perfect sense to me. Um, the idea being that basically you can identify hibernating myocardium um, by virtue of elevated glucose uptake by FDG PET scanning and you can look at that and directly compare it 
um, with perfusion by using something like ammonia or, or, or water. Um, and it seemed like a perfectly sensible approach. Um, and I, 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 I don't know what's happened in terms of the evolution of cardiac imaging in that it seems to have shifted quite dramatically away from PET and towards MR. Um, and I would like to think that we could turn the tide because I think that I, I'm hoping I'm demonstrating that there is more that we can do with these approaches by visualizing the biochemistry. Um, I had a, co a, a conversation with one of my cardiology colleagues because I, I feel like I've been I've been banging my head up, up, up against this wall for, for years in that why, does people, why do people not do PET anymore? Um, and I think there are a number of different reasons for it, many of them cultural. Um, I think some of it is our own fault in that we don't blow our own trumpets on this enough. And, I, and, and I'm going to try and redress that by showing what the possibilities for these techniques are. Why it's not, why it's not done in the clinic, I don't know. I think part of it, I was, I was, like I said, I was chatting with a cardiology colleague and he said that when they are taught about cardiac imaging, the, they are taught about MR and CT by cardiologists that do it routinely. When they're then taught about nuclear imaging, it's usually done as a separate mod, module by, by radiologists. And I think that's already sowing a seed in the cardiologist's mind that MRI is more fashionable than PET. Now, I may be completely wrong about this, but this was part of the approach that, this is part of one of the rationales that, that, that he said. And I can see that in, in the acute setting, MRI blows PET into the weeds. I completely, completely get that. But for these chronic, low-grade, high-set, low-grade global injuries, these molecular imaging techniques, when you're looking at functional, sorry, a biochemical change, are so sensitive that I think they, they definitely have a home. Um, and hopefully I've highlighted why they could be used again. But why why FDG pet mismatch has seemed to have taken a back seat, I really don't know and I don't understand. Um, anonymous attendee says, this is great technology and it would be great to use. However, can it seems- I just, before you, Richard, before you sure. move on to the next question, can I just add to that last question? I think you've really touched on it very nicely and that is, that is we sort of need a paradigm shift in that uh, I don't wish to be rude to my cardiology colleagues, but you know, I'm, I'm a physiologist who's interested in, in a beating heart and we are uh, we tend to be driven by functional readout and as you pointed out very nicely it may well be a bit late in the disease process if all we've got is you know heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or whatever with diastolic dysfunction uh, you know by the time we get to that point all the molecular determinants of the disease are in place so the paradigm shift that you're appealing to us to consider is massively important. We don't need to detect these diseases once they've happened. We need to detect them 10 years before when we can do something about it. And, and I think that's the reason why they probably haven't been in, engaged. Well, mainly because you guys have been a bit tardy in coming up with the techniques, but now you're on the case you know, that really you're opening doors for us. And that, you know, you said at the start of your presentation, you know, this is something you're appealing to this audience is to look, how do we take this forward? And, you know, if you can come up, you're saying you're only limited by your imagination and the ability of the chemist to make a ligand. So, you know, if we can take this forward to identify the correct molecular biomarkers that can detect disease very early, then maybe this will be adopted by our uh, function-focused cardiologists. You know, this is what you've got to do. And I just think that's an absolutely brilliant message to come out of this presentation. I think it's fantastic. Yeah. There's, there's something else that I could follow up further with in that not only do we find it difficult to engage with cardiologists, we find it difficult to engage with basic cardiac scientists. <laughs> In yeah, but that's, much, that's, that's, that's your personal problem, Richard. <laughs> no, 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 that is, and that's because I know a lot of you. Um, or, or more importantly, you know me. But I, I think um, one of the other problems that we have, and this is something that we, we, that we really struggle with, is actually recruiting 
cardiac scientists into the field. The, Im the imaging sciences are very heavily dominated by physics and by chemistry for, you know, for understandable reasons. But imaging and the, and the, the, um, the possibilities of imaging aren't taught at undergraduate level in biology or physiology or any of the biological sciences. And so biologists aren't aware of the possibilities of this technology or even, it, even that it exists as a career path. Um, I kind of stumbled uh, upon this field almost by accident. Um, and you know, I've seen the potential in it. And I think that, and this, maybe this is a note to self, that I need to get out there and I need, or we need as a community to, to teach this, these techniques as, as a technology which is exploitable because we, we have a really hard time recruiting PhD students because we're not visible to them because we don't, we're not in that sort of that educational pathway. Um, and I think that's probably the, that's probably a problem both in terms of the basic science as well as clinical medicine. Um, so yeah, maybe, maybe I just need to pull my finger out and get busy. But, um, but, um, but I think, yeah, this is, this is something that I think that we should really try and push as well. Well, it's, it's, uh, I while I'm on it, I do actually have one vacant PhD studentship available. If anybody is interested in doing a PhD, shameless plug. Um, if if anybody does have, if anybody's interested in doing a PhD in the early detection of off-target radiotherapy, radiotherapeutic injury with a miniaturized small animal uh, uh, radiation uh, beam machine. I've lost, I've lost the, I've lost the use of my brain to describe what it is. Um, that's the next, that's the next, that's the next phase of some of this work in that we've actually got a small animal, a radiator, which can do a clinical equivalent of these clinical radiotherapeutic machines. And so we're going to use these technologies for that. So we have a fully funded PhD studentship available. Plug over. So you've heard it here. Start applying. <laughs> I think Richard, the, um, the, it's interesting that Heinrich is the man who asks you that question because... Well, as, the grand lady of it all, right? So, well, be, yes, and because yeah. he's coming from... Uh, he's a card-carrying biochemist as well as a card-carrying cardiologist. Yeah. So you've got to come from the molecular end of things to recognise the potential. If you come from the cardiac end of things, uh, you may not recognise potential. And Heinrich clearly... Uh, has for many years uh, recognised that importance. So uh, let's move on to the next question. Uh, uh, Dan Johnson. Uh, Daniel Johnson. Asked, oh, no, no, we just went out uh, about how expensive it all is. Oh, this is. Yeah, this is another good question. So uh, an anonymous, anonymous attendee said, this is great technology and it would be great to use. However, it seems out of reach because it might be very expensive. Can you give a ballpark of daily expenses aside from equipment for these traces? Okay, so number of different issues within this. I, I guess in terms of out of reach, this is again something which I, I rail against because sometimes I get the impression that it's not exploited in cardiology because they think, oh, we don't have the technology. I mean, this technology exists in every hospital up and down you know, throughout the world because it's used every day in cancer imaging. Um, and in the States, um, I, again, I, I think nuclear, nuclear medicine doesn't use... Well, cardiology doesn't use nuclear medicine so much in the UK and in Europe, but uh, nuclear medicine in particular, MUGA scanning is a workhorse in, in, the, in the US for looking at cardiac function. So availability actually isn't a primary limiting factor in the first instance. In terms of affordability, um, it's one of these things that I don't have to deal with such sundry issues because I get my radio traces from free from the pet centre in our basement. Um, the PET scanners themselves, I guess, are comparable to an MRI scanner in terms of their cost. The state-of-the-art whole-body PET scanner that I showed at the end, um, Ramsey Badawi reckons that that costs about $10 million to build, but it's a one-off and it's the first of its kind. He suggests or he thinks that it doesn't actually need to be two meters long to get a lot of the gains that they've got with it. And he thinks that he can strip it down. He's done the simulations. He thinks he can strip it down to something which is about a meter long and, and basically image from uh, top of your head to your groin, which is where most of the interesting stuff goes on. 
and he thinks that you can get a significant gain there in a scanner which would cost less than five million dollars which again puts it in the ballpark of how much a state-of-the-art MRI scanner would cost. So it's not prohibitively expensive. What is expensive is the infrastructure in terms of having a working cyclotron and a radiochemistry facility. Um, but again, you can potentially sidetrack that or sidestep that with the use of um, generators. Um, so copper 62, uh, rubidium, for example, they don't need a cyclotron. You can make them in a generator. So what happens is you get the product, you get the, the mother radionuclide from either a nuclear processing plant or from a cyclotron. That though go, then goes on to effectively an HPLC column within a case. And then you elute your, your daughter radionuclide off of that column. So the, 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 it comes in a, in a lead box basically about yay big. You then can then have that in your, in your facility and you can elute your radionuclide off of that until it's exhausted and then you can swap it out for another one. So there's, there's quite some flexibility there in terms of what you can do. A lot of cyclotron, a lot of pet centers don't have their own cyclotrons and they ship radionuclides about throughout the country. So that's, a, it is a, it's a cost and it's a substantial cost, but it's not necessarily prohibitive. In terms of the cost of FDG, I don't know what the going rate is. I think it's something like a couple of hundred pounds per mega, no, per, per gigabecker. I don't honestly know. Our radio copper, um, we get charged about 400 pounds for four gigabecks. Um, we did, when our cyclotron went down, we actually ended up having to get it ship, shipped from Italy and that cost us about three thousand pounds and that wasn't something that we're going to do again in, in any kind of hurry but we needed it for some experiments um immediately so so but there's a lot of flexibility you'd get a lot of experiments out of that amount of copper tracer wouldn't you uh, not, as many, not as many as we'd like because okay. it, it, so, it, 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 it lasts like i say it, typically it would last for about three or four days three or four days but so it can serve, I, guess, I guess the bottom line at the moment, experimentally, it's not inexpensive in terms of setting up and consumables. On the other hand, if uh, in the context of the early detection of disease, if you intervene early, you save a health service like we've got in the, in the UK, tax-funded NHS, you'll save them an awful lot of money in the long term if we intervene early. So Absolutely. experimentally, or, or... it might be a little bit expensive, but it should be cost effective if it's if, if it's therapeutically effective or if you or if you can or if you can stop stop a stage one clinical trial by saying your drug is cardiotoxic how much money are you going to save <laughs> yeah <good point. laughs> moving um, swiftly on daniel. <laughs> uh, uh, daniel johnson uh, really interesting techniques thanks i was just wondering about the anthracycline work uh, what kind of doses were you using for these experiments? And did you then check if the mitochondrial depolarization was sustained even after stopping the treatment? Great question. Um, this is something, again, that we think is very, very important. Uh, a lot of work um, which has done, been done in the past um, and is still being done uses very extreme, you know, for this kind of proof of concept work, uses very extreme doses of anthracyclines to get a positive result which is not necessarily clinically relevant. So you can use very high doses of anthracyclines and then image your animals just before they die. And to be honest, I mean, we're all aware of work like this, which is out there. The doses that we use are approximately um, relevant to the clinical situation. We're going up to about 10 mg per kg, um, which is equivalent approximately uh, to about 400 mg per square meter as a clinical dose, which is a threshold for where they would be watching those patients closely in terms of cardiotoxicity. But again, we're using this as a single injection bolus. And this was, we've only done this um, to generate a relatively extreme degree of cardiotoxicity for proof of concept. What we're now going back to do, because we want to make sure that when we do then translate this stuff to the clinic, because what happens is you would get you 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 do this in an extreme animal model. You'll say my imaging agent works. You then inject her into a patient, and it doesn't work because you use a completely irrelevant uh, degree of injury, which is 
which means that your imaging agent can be extremely insensitive. It works once, you publish once, you move on to your next thing, but you've got something which is never going to get translated. And that's a waste of everyone's time. And there's a lot of work like that out there, to be frank. Um, what we're trying to do is to go back, now that we've got proof of concept that our imaging agents work, and go back to a less extreme degree of cardiotoxicity. So rather than doing these acute IP doses, we're now going back and we're loading our anthracyclines into osmotic mini pumps, which we implant under the skin, and they deliver the same total accumulative doses. But rather than as an, as an acute IP dose, we can deliver that same dose over a month. And what we're trying to do then is to come up with a clinically relevant anthracycline injury and then we will go in with these imaging agents again and hopefully demonstrate that they work in something which is clinically relevant rather than just stopping after we've got an imaging agent, which gives us a pretty picture because we, you know, that's wasting everybody's time. Um, so that's our motivation for the next phase of our work. Now we've got imaging agents that work under the extreme conditions. Do they actually work in a model which is clinically relevant? Because if we can't demonstrate that, why would we then want to progress those to a clinical trial? I guess, Richard, you've answered the question sort of about reversibility. I'm guessing that in your model, it's, you've probably either not looked at reversibility or it's very unlikely to be reversible. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's the problem. I mean, you know, I, to my knowledge, uh, anthracycline cardiotoxicity, once it's overt, isn't reversible. Well, um, yeah. one, of the things, um, one, of the, one of the things that we are looking at as the next phase of this work is that we've got some very interesting uh, therapeutics um, which we think may be cardioprotective uh, against anthracycline cardiotoxicity um, and the next phase of this work will be to use our imaging techniques to demonstrate that these cardioprotectants work um, and that's the next phase of the this is the next phase of the work which we've currently got a grant application just about to go back into the BHF um, to try and support that work. So it'll be a combination of developing the imaging techniques as well as developing the cardioprotectants and hopefully, hopefully marrying those two work streams together to demonstrate the utility of the imaging as well as developing new drugs. Richard, that is absolutely fantastic. Uh, you've spent a long time answering uh, a lot of very interesting questions, so thank you for doing that. Uh, thank you very much for your question. I have to say this was, I mean, I worked down the corridor from you and I'm still um, don't really know what you're doing and, and I'm just blown away by uh, your presentation. It's an absolutely superb presentation. Thanks, Richard. And, and very honest and sensible uh, answers to a lot of questions there. So thanks, Richard, for doing that. Um, Davo, do you want to finish off with uh, any, share your screen and show anything or are you done? Yes, I mean, I can just, again, once again, advertise, um, I'm just sharing my screen now again, once again, advertise tomorrow's talk by Emma Louise Robinson from Maastricht University. And of course, I just like to thank the ISHR for supporting this webinar series. And okay. of course, thank both of you, Richard, for giving a wonderful, wonderful webinar and Mike for, again, chairing to absolute perfection. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, creep. Uh, thank, <laughs> thank you, guys. And, uh, best wishes to everybody out there. And hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye, all.